Uh, I'm uh, the eldest in the family of six. And being the eldest daughter in the family, of course, I have to show good example. And uh, I have to lead uh, in terms of uh, in education and so on. So I was sent to, uh, to a boarding school. So I went to school, Sekolah Tun Fatimah Johor Bahru. And I was there for six years. And uh, during my secondary education years, um, I was sort of introduced to science because uh, the teachers during that time, they were so interesting, especially in chemistry. I still remember my teacher, Mrs. Lowe. Every day she come with a different clothes. So that was made me so interesting to come to her class because to see what she wears for that day, besides the science and the chemistry that she taught me. Then after I finished my MCE, I was selected to uh, study overseas to take up science because uh, during those years, Malaysia has only two universities and they needed more uh, of the young uh, stu the students to go out and do science. So I choose uh, chemistry. If you ask me why chemistry, because being an all-rounder, I guess uh, among all the sciences, chemistry is the most interesting because uh, I take it chemistry as the queen of science. So that's why uh, and when you do chemistry, now you know that chemists never die. We only reach equilibrium. And chemists have the solutions. So there's so much about chemistry. Nothing on earth is not chemistry. So that's why I'm a chemist. Then uh, I went for my further studies in the US. When I came back, I joined the university as a, a lecturer. And I was in University Technology Malaysia for 31 years. Uh, and I retired last year and of course uh, as an academic in university you have to do a lot of things not only teaching you have to do science you have to do research and uh, you have to introduce uh, science to the young and to the students at school as well so uh, I spend a lot of my time in UTM doing research and uh, at the same time uh, the outcome of doing research is you will publish uh, your results and uh, at the same time I, I've been so fortunate that I've been recognized in the work that I've done in UTM. So basically uh, that's uh, how um, my work was you know and, and in terms of uh, really looking into the science and how uh, the young, especially to, of today, should uh, continue uh, the work in science, especially those who are very uh, good in, in academic. Uh, I was introduced to research actually when I did my PhD and in the University of Cambridge in the UK. And uh, it so happened that uh, the work that I've been doing is on nanos, nanomaterials, nanostructured materials. And uh, the specific field uh, of my research is on uh, zeolites. And uh, zeolite is uh, happened to be a nano structured materials. And when I came back to Malaysia, I wanted to continue with my work in, uh, in uh, zeolites and so on. And uh, naturally, when I developed the lab, I came up with new products in nano material and so on. And that was in the early 2000s. And uh, during that time, I think the U.S. as one of the countries that is very advanced in nanotechnology, uh, the government spent a lot of money into the development of nanotechnology because nanotechnology is an emerging uh, technology. It is uh, foresighted to be the technology of the 21st century. So if you ask me what is nanotechnology, it's a science of small things where uh, whatever we are doing today in the micro world, macro world, we just have to transform ourselves into the nano scale, where nano scale is 1 to 100 nanometer. So it is very small. In fact, with our naked eyes, you can't see uh, nano things, right? For example, if you take a strand of your hair, it is 50,000 times smaller than a strand of the hair. So that's why you can't see nano. But the uh, impact of nanotechnology is so huge is that, uh, for example, if you take a nanomaterial, a, a spoonful of that material 
will cover an area of a football field. So the material that I've developed, for example, they all have this kind of properties. And when you do nanotechnology, whatever that comes out at that scale must be different from what you have seen, right? For example, you take gold. Gold, if you see when you wear gold, is color is different. If you take gold and make it into the nano size, it will be green or red in color. And the properties is totally different from the normal gold that we see. So nanotechnology is the technology of today and tomorrow. So if, and it is the uh, convergence of the sciences. So science is very much demanded if you want to do nanotechnology. You have to know chemistry, you have to know physics, you have to be good in math mathematics, and of course, uh, biology. And uh, if we look around today, all the nano materials uh, are being commercialized and we are using it. You are wearing nano clothes, okay? If you don't realize it. So uh, many of us, we are using cosmetics, which is embedded with uh, nano materials. Because of the properties that it has, it helps us a lot in our life. I think since uh, Malaysia embarked on science and technology, as far as I can remember about 30 or 40 years ago, when I was growing up, and I'm one of those in the first few batches of scientists being sent overseas and so on, um, I think the government uh, really um, see the importance of scientists for the country. Now we are in the millennium and we know that uh, Malaysia is going, going to be an advanced uh, nation by 2020, which is just about seven years away. We can't do without scientists. Okay? Uh, we know that in order to be an advanced country, we are in the, you call it as the knowledge era, and we have to be innovative. And our Prime Minister even said that the country needs technology developers, not only technology users. And we are very good consumers, Malaysians. We are, you know, when tomorrow there's a new handphone that comes out, we'll be lining up to go and buy them. But we are not good prosumers. Prosumers means that we not only use, but we at the same time uh, come up with our own product. So we need scientists, right? And until today, actually until last year or so, we don't know how many do we need actually. We always say that we are short of scientists, we are short of technologies, but we never know where we're going and how many of them that we need. So we embark on uh, coming out with a roadmap for human capital for the, for, in science and technology for Malaysia. And uh, today, after building up this uh, roadmap, then only we realize actually the country needs 500,000 graduates in science and technology, which is, you know, if you think about it, it's a big uh, number. And with seven more years to go, and at the rate that we are going, with the number of students going to the science streams getting uh, less and less every year, I'm not that optimistic that we are going to achieve that number. But anyway, now and today, we know our direction. We know how many of these scientists that we need. And we have tried to suggest to the government and the ministry uh, the way forward and what should be done in order for us to achieve the number by the year 2020. Women in science. <laughs> okay. Um, um, since your question is advice to women in science, I think now uh, our country is uh, going ahead with more women involving in science actually, not only in science, in all the fields. If you look at the university scenario today, uh, about 60% of the students in the universities today are women. And uh, we are very fortunate, I am very fortunate to be in Malaysia because women in Malaysia get whatever we want as long as we excel in what we do and we have never been discriminated against right compared to women from other countries so for the young uh, women of today 
my advice is just go ahead with whatever you think you are best in. You just have to strive and don't think yourself as a woman. If you want to excel in your work, you must think as who you are. You know, for example, if you are a scientist, you are a scientist. So hopefully you can do whatever you want to do. And don't mix your career with your family. Because if you are married as a woman in Malaysia, if you have children, if you uh, cannot, you know, like uh, really concentrate on your work while you are at ho at, in your office, and then when you go back at home, you think about your office, then it's going to uh, impact your life. So organize your life, okay? So everybody gets 24 hours a day. And I've gone through this. I've got two children. I raised them by myself. I've never had mates until today. I ironed my husband's clothes until today. So I don't think other women can, you know, cannot do the same thing. The only thing that I do less is cook because my husband can cook very well. So, <laughs> so I'm very fortunate about that. But, you know, you just have to do it and you must enjoy your life and don't complain. The Generation Y, they are very lucky. I have two Generation Y in my family. And uh, I'm a baby boomer, right? During my time, we are born, we have to strive because our parents were not well off. But the generation why you are lucky because you have parents who can support you and you have everything that you want, you know? So it doesn't mean that you, you don't do anything. So my advice to the generation why is you just have to start from scratch. Because nobody is going to help you if you don't do it. So you just have to do it. And of course, the Generation Y complains a lot because they feel that they are not appreciated and they want to do things uh, and they are quite impatient because they want to do things today and get the results tomorrow. And you must remember, we went through 30 years in our career to achieve where we are now. So it's the same to you because the future is yours. So you have to think of what you want to do in order to live in this ideal world of tomorrow. It's your tomorrow. Okay?